So on my last few videos, my favorite prequel hater left me some feedback, and I love feedback from the infamous. After all, I do love democracy. So when Mike basically made this point, he made it mute by acknowledging that not all movies have to follow this guideline. So The Phantom Menace doesn't follow that guideline. And since Mike has made it clear that he has a bias against George Lucas as a filmmaker, it paints a much wider picture of the bad faith arguments that he's putting forward in his reviews. Obi-Wan, like I said, is a Padawan. He's not the leader. He still has much to learn about patience and the Force. He's kind of like Luke in this way. I only loosely break the rules to establish the president for the traits, because this entire review, Mike has been creating this narrative about the characters that just isn't true. Part 3 But Palpatine wanted to create a crisis on Naboo so that the naive young queen would propose a vote of no confidence for Chancellor Valorum. This would lead to Palpatine getting elected in his place, right? So how does killing the Jedi or creating a communications blackout on the planet even get word back to the Senate that there is a crisis? When, when the guys told Palpatine that the Jedis were there, he should have said this. Tell the Jedi that there will be no negotiations. Tell them that you plan to invade the planet next, and then send them back to Coruscant to inform the Senate. Instead, he tells them to do the exact opposite of what will help his plan. Like he wanted her to sign the treaty, right? I want that treaty signed. He seemed really intent on having her sign the treaty to make the invasion legal. So what if she was like a total coward and then actually signed the treaty? Palpatine is playing both sides. Whatever happens, he will win. By killing Jedi, he wins by just killing Jedi because Sith kill Jedi. But it also prevents the Jedi from getting in contact with the Chinese alien. And since the Chinese aliens are such cowards, they might foil Palpy's plans by either settling the dispute early or revealing the Sith presence. So if the dispute is settled early, there's no conflict, and then there's no vote. And yes, the Sith presence is revealed by Darth Maul. But since Darth Maul dies, they only believe he's the one Sith. And the blocking of the communications still helps Palpatine. Because if the invasion goes to plan, the Chinese aliens take over and have Queen Amidala sign the treaty, Palpatine still gets his way and the invasion is legal. And so, if the invasion is considered legal, Senator Palpatine could probably just say, Hey, how did you guys like let this happen, I thought this was a democracy. And be like, vote of no confidence for Chancellor Valorum, his leadership is lacking. And if Palpatine said what you wanted him to say, there would be no conflict because Chancellor Valorum would be like, well that proves it, there's an invasion, we gotta go help him. So there would be no vote of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum's leadership. So anyways, it's time to kill off the Jedi. Oh good. How do they go about it? Well. They start pumping in an obvious deadly white gas into the room. Hey idiots! Have you ever heard of carbon monoxide? It's odorless and colorless. Also, moments earlier the Jedi willingly drank tea that was given to them. Hey, you guys got any rat poison lying around? Put it in the tea! Put it in the tea! They'll drink it! Put the rat poison in the t Finally, two and a half videos in, we finally get some valid criticisms. Yes, the gas plot thing is super stupid and convoluted. Yes, they should have just put poison in the tea. Even though I'm pretty sure the silver C-3PO was just doing its own thing, probably getting the tea at like the fucking teacher's lounge or something. But I don't think it ruins the movie. It is a big massive plot hole with many stupidity layers on top of it, but that's just one mistake. I didn't say the movies were perfect, but it doesn't mean they're bad movies because of this. Number four. Who's doing what? Where? Why? Why are the Shatnerians taking orders from this mystery hologram again? What did he promise them that would be so worth risking their entire organization for? Oh, we're never told, are we? When you're talking about a huge organization that's run with military efficiency, then they're probably going to want something in return for the use of 30 of their ships and risking everything. I find it hard to believe that these guys never started pointing fingers after they got caught. The reason they're probably not snitching on Palpatine is because they probably don't want to screw over the most powerful person in the galaxy. And I think we can just assume that they just want independence because in their actions of the next few movies, they start a confederacy with a bunch of other planets that just want independence and they probably just want independence to do evil things. And it seems 
seems among this race of Chinese aliens, Sith Lords clearly have some sort of notoriety, so it seems that they're just willing to trust in his plans. And to any average moviegoer, all they think is that these people are Palpatine's henchmen, and they do what he says. Number five. I can't put enough quotation marks around the word story, so I won't. Anyways, Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon, they end up in the hangar bay somehow, where the droid armies are being staged for an invasion. Why don't the Jedis just start fighting all of them? Then steal a ship and head back to Coruscant to tell the Galactic Senate what's going on. It's not so crazy, because later in the film they attempt to run the blockade with one ship and they make it through. The fact that they even tried that makes this a possible option. Let's indulge Mike's plan for a second. So Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon start fighting all the droids. Oh shit, turns out they've blown their cover and now fucking roly-poly droids are after them. Boom boom, a bunch of them are surrounded them, they get captured or killed. Well that worked out well. That's what happens when you try to fight a fucking army. But instead Qui-Gon and all his wisdom thinks it's a better idea to go down with the army to quote, warn the Naboo. Hey genius. If you're going down with the army, don't you think it's a little too late to warn them about the army? And what the fuck are the Naboo gonna do anyways? They don't even have a real army, just volunteers. Anyways, so then for no reason they decide to stow away on different ships. Is this guy a fucking retard? Let's think about this. Number one, increase the chances of getting caught by 100%. Is this guy a fucking retard? It literally decreases the chances of getting caught by 50%. Because if they get caught together in a group, then it's game over. But if only one of them gets caught, the other one still has a chance of completing the mission. Two, have no one else to help you if you get caught and get into a fight with robots. Sure, that's a possibility, but it's still a better plan than sticking together. When getting caught is still ultimately failure because it's a whole fucking army you're going to be fighting. Three, increase the possibility of getting separated by hundreds, if not thousands of miles by not knowing where the other craft is going to land on the planet. This could be either a con or a plus, because you could be separated really close to the place, or you could be separated really far. Then although the reason for them going down to the planet was to warn the Nebu about the army, they decide to follow a cartoon rabbit underwater. Why? Why not just keep moving towards the Nabu city? Hey Ginny, I thought you went down there to warn the Nabu. How is this gonna accomplish that? What was your plan from the beginning when you got down there? Did you plan to find a magical underwater craft that would go through the planet's core? Or did you just plan to run along the surface? This is the first point they should have ditched Jar Jar. This is also the point when the movie starts to officially fall apart. This is the moment when the Star Wars saga is now damaged totally beyond repair. The lapses in common sense and logic begin to compound on the movie and now it is broken. First of all, you clearly see they're trying to make their way to the Naboo city. When Jar Jar starts talking about his city, they assume they might be able to find some sort of transportation that could take them there faster. So Jar Jar proves to be some sort of asset. I don't think I'm really ready for these Jar Jar criticisms because Jar Jar usually tends to have some usefulness and Mike is probably the same person who hated Return of the Jedi because of the Ewoks because he's heartless. He's like, oh, this is this is too much children's stuff in my children movie. It's Star Wars is dark and gritty. The original movies were dark and gritty. We get it. Shut the fuck up. Oh my God. But anyway, congrats to Mike for getting one criticism correct in his entire series. Hopefully Hopefully he gets some more correct, but I don't know if that's gonna hold true.